There really is a sea change in this attitude toward crime and punishment across the country over the past 10 years. That's Adam Gelb. We'll be speaking with him today about this episode's data point, 13%. It signals a bit of a turning point in public safety in this country. We'll also be joined by special guests later in this episode who will tell us how research and data led to real change in corrections policies in South Carolina, where there are fewer people in prison and crime is down. This is After the Fact, a podcast that explores the facts, numbers, and trends shaping our world. I'm Dan LaDuke, and this new series is brought to you by the nonpartisan Pew Charitable Trusts, which works to improve public policy, inform the public, and invigorate civic life. And that's what we hope to do here, offer some solutions to meet the challenges facing the world today, inform you a bit, and maybe invigorate our national conversation. Beginning in the 1970s, America's prison population skyrocketed, rising nearly five times historic levels and reaching a point where one in 100 adults were behind bars. The growth was largely the result of state laws and policies that put more and more offenders behind bars and kept them there longer and longer. But in recent years, states have begun embracing proven strategies that offer better ways to protect the public, which is, after all, the most important consideration. These strategies ensure offenders are held accountable and that there's a greater return on taxpayer dollars spent on prisons and corrections. In fact, since 2007, policymakers in 33 states have changed laws and adopted new policies, and it's had impact. Which leads us to this episode's data point. Since hitting that peak of 1 in 100 in 2007, incarceration levels nationwide are now down 13%. Instead of trying to build their way to a safer society with more prisons, state leaders are reversing a trend that was costing them over $50 billion a year. These new ways have been embraced by policymakers across the country and across party lines. They have allowed states to spend billions less on prisons, and all this has been happening while crime rates have continued to fall. Here to tell how this new approach works are three guests. Two of them are in South Carolina, which has been a leader in these efforts. Brian Sterling is the director of the State Department of Corrections, and State Senator Gerald Molloy helped enact the changes. We'll hear from them in a few minutes. First, we're joined by Adam Gelb, director of Pew's Public Safety Performance Project. Its work in corrections policy has spanned a decade, and Adam and his team are familiar figures in many state capitals, helping governors and legislators navigate these important and often controversial concerns. So the Public Safety Performance Project... Man, that's a mouthful. Uh, so tell us, what do you do? I mean, let me tell you what, what that really means. We try to help states figure out how to squeeze as much public safety as possible out of their correction system. We want high-performing correction systems that make sure that prisons are holding those people that uh, we truly are afraid of uh, and are steering lower-level offenders into alternatives that work better and cost less. Now, the reason we got into this is because there is an enormous prison population in this country. Over the last few decades, the numbers have soared. Tell us how we got to this point. Yeah, it's a, it's, it's a long and very sad tale, quite frankly. Uh, in this country, we had uh, what criminologists call the stability of punishment from, from the 1920s through the early 1970s, about a 50-year period when the incarceration rate ticked a little bit up and down a little bit, but it was really flat for this long period of time. And then the early 70s, it started skyrocketing and reached about 10 years ago now, uh, about 2007, 2008, a point where we had one out of every 100 adults in this country behind bars. And that's just a phenomenal number. Everybody thought that the best way to try to keep crime and drugs at bay was to lock up as many people for as long as possible. So there were new laws passed that sent more people to prison, uh, other laws that kept people in prison longer. And the accumulation of all this was this five-fold increase in the nation's incarcerated population. And not only the size of the population, but the enormous cost of it. Okay, let's go back to this episode's data point, which is the 13% decrease in incarceration rates. That is progress in terms of the overall incarceration rate for the nation, but where does it fit in historically? And what does it say about what may be left to do? It means tens of thousands of fewer people locked up. It means billions of dollars saved in prisons that weren't built and other costs not incurred to taxpayers. 
But at the same time, it means that there's still a long way to go. This is a rate that is still more than four times higher than those historical levels. Well, you spend a lot of time out in state houses, right? You're talking with legislators who are the folks who go to the Rotary Club meetings, who are out at the uh, chicken dinners to meet their constituents. State legislators are probably some of the, the key people in this country who know the real pulse of the nation. But they're not hearing a huge pushback among the general public over making some of these changes. It seems like we've made a change as a nation is what I guess I'm getting at. That's exactly right. There really is a sea change in this attitude toward crime and punishment across the country over the past 10 years. Uh, Our project at Pew has worked in 33 states around the country at this point. Um, And in many of these states, significant reforms to sentencing and corrections policies, those very policies that sent people to prison for longer and kept them there longer are being dialed back in many of these states with unanimous votes. So policymakers on both sides of the aisle saying enough is enough. We've got enough cells to keep the the people who are serious, chronic, violent offenders locked up, but we really got uh, to do a better job and we frankly owe it to taxpayers to find lower cost alternatives for these people who otherwise are just cycling in and out of these prisons and we're not accomplishing anything. When we talk about corrections policy and the sort of research that you rely on, Adam, the word recidivism comes up a lot. What that basically means is sort of the revolving door prison, right? People leaving and coming back. Uh, So more specifically, what does it mean and why is it important to know about that? Well, it's not that much more complicated than what you said. Uh, Recidivism, it's kind of a mouthful, but but most people know what it means. And it's just simply the rate at which people come back to prison. Uh, And uh, it is probably the central point of most of the conversations we have in the state. But there's pretty much universal agreement that for the people who are getting out the back end, we need to do a better job of helping them be successful and making sure they don't come back again and slowing that revolving door. And here's the the key point about this, that for all this huge increase in spending on corrections from $10 billion to over $50 billion over the last 25 years or so, there has not been a detectable change in the national recidivism rate. And this is one of the things that is uh, really convincing policymakers on both sides of the aisle that we're not getting good public safety return on investment, that we can't just continue to spin this revolving door around and around. We have to have more effective policies practices and programs. Well, a lot of the reason folks are spinning through that door is because they may be violating parole and probation conditions that have been placed on them and, in fact, end up uh, serving more time for that infraction rather than the time they served for their original offense. So what does that say about how the system is working? It says that the system has been geared toward catching people when they mess up rather than helping them succeed. And that's a dynamic that's got to change. Dan, about half of the people who return to prison go back for breaking the rules of their supervision, not for committing new crimes. But the key point here, Dan, is that, and one of the most important findings in the research is that there is very little connection between the amount of time you spend in prison and the likelihood that you'll commit a new crime on the back end. Really? This is where the assumption has been over the years, right, that if you if you lock somebody up for longer, they're going to learn their lesson better. And you're going to send a stronger message to the public at large that you shouldn't commit these crimes because there will be severe punishment. And what turns out to be the, the most important lesson from the research in crime and punishment is that the swiftness and certainty of responses to behavior of punishments or rewards are much more important than the severity of those punishments. And so this central fact is driving a lot of the policy change. So again, getting this stuff um, through a legislature, any passage of a new law is a challenge. I mean, that's the nature of the process. That's the American system. Um, But so who are the natural allies? Who are the natural skeptics when you're in a state? At this point, there is an amazing array of supporters for smarter sentencing and corrections policies. There are business leaders who have come out in support of of this and held huge convenings of uh, business leaders across their state to say we shouldn't be pouring our uh, state tax dollars into these dead-end prisons. We should be instead redirecting this money to workforce development, to education, and making sure that our businesses and our state thrives. And uh, we have now done a lot of polling and public opinion research across the country. People uh, on a general level 
think that lower level offenders should be in alternatives. And at a specific policy level, there are high levels of support across party lines, across regions of the country, and even in law enforcement households and victim households where people are saying we just want the revolving door to stop. And so there's been a tremendous support across all these sort of non-traditional allies in this field for uh, for policies that reinvest prison savings into more effective programs that will change offender behavior. So we've gotten to 33 states. That's two-thirds. Uh, how do you keep this momentum going? Perhaps it's in the rest of the states, but even in the states where there has been progress. How does, how does that sort of momentum continue? And what is what, if any, is Pew's role in that? You're going to be talking shortly to, to two of those uh, champions from South Carolina, people who were uh, not necessarily even focused on this issue, let alone dedicating their lives to it, have gone through this data-driven process and now have decided, this is what I want to do with my life. I, I want to try to make sure that we have a more effective and more fair uh, criminal justice system. Sure. It's going to be leadership right. and it's going to be the leadership and the courage of, of folks who understand what's at stake here. And if you do actually look at the data and look at the research, you can make progress. We turn now to someone who has shown that leadership and knows what's been at stake in his home state of South Carolina, State Senator Gerald Malloy. So South Carolina has has become a real national leader in changing its criminal justice system. How, how did that play out in your state, which we know is traditionally known for being very tough on crime? South Carolina had a tough on crime, um, not necessarily a smart on crime attitude. We had taken a lock them up and throw away the key approach, and we were somewhat of a lock them up society. Well, we had a history of establishing new criminal offenses and stiff penalties based on reactions to um, headlines instead of using what we knew that we should be using now is evidence-based practices. In 1983, what we found was that we had about 9,000 inmates. Well, in 2009, we were up to 25,000. We would expect to accumulate another 3,000 over the next five years. When we were able to put the numbers together, the prison system was experiencing a record number of inmates. This was a tremendous burden on our system, and, and basically we knew that we had to end up making some changes. So we had to put together some legislative initiatives to um, listen to these alternative solutions. And so once we could determine what the drivers were in the system, then we could effectuate some change that may come up with some good results. We sometimes forget that the only way you can make progress is often you have to have a set of facts that everybody agrees on. And then you sort of figure out where to go forward from there. And and that it sounds like you created a process where everyone could sort of in a transparent way see what the facts were and then try to find a solution. This approach took the pee out of politics. It put it into people. So we brought all of the stakeholders and put them in the same room. And then we started having a discussion, and that's how we, we figured out that we could end up making progress. If you look at it from a cost perspective, in 83, our state has spent about $63 million in prison operations. By 2008, which is under 25 years later, the cost um, had increased by more than 500%. And so we were bordering up on $400 million then. One driver that was critical was that about 44% of our people that were in prison during that time were in prison for 18 months or less. And so what we found was is that we were locking up a lot of individuals, incarcerating a lot of individuals for minor drug offenses, for property crimes, and for matters such as driving under suspension, non-DUI related. And so those were the individuals that we did not need in, in the prison system occupying the bed space. So we reclassified crimes. And so we're happy to report now that after almost seven years look back, you know, in South Carolina for the work that was done, I think we're the 11th highest incarcerated state in the country, and now we are 20th in South Carolina. We have averted our prison growth probably 14 percent, and so the number that I gave you earlier was almost 25,000. We're down now to about 20,700 average prison population in 2016. That's 14 percent less. Of course, once the legislature passes these changes, they must be implemented. That job fell to the South Carolina Department of Corrections, which has been able to close six prisons. 
The department's director is Brian Sterling. So what are the markers that the legislature laid down for you to continue showing success? Well, I think some of the markers are the cost savings, which is tremendous. We went through some tough times a couple of years ago with the recession. For the taxpayer, the cost of cost avoidance was just under $500 million. That's a lot of money. So I think some of the justice reinvestment money can go back in the prison system, and some of the things that we've done with it have helped the recidivism rate and I think made the state safer at less of a cost. South Carolina has been a real national leader in changing its criminal justice system. How did that play out in your state, which is traditionally known for being very tough on crime? Sure, and I still think we are tough on crime. I frankly think putting someone in prison and feeding them three meals a day, giving them free health care and a place to sleep is, you know, as opposed to having them out on the street and require them to work, pay taxes, pay back their victims, that's really paying for their crime. So um, I think that is actually a little harder on crime. I know incarceration is tough. Basically, in South Carolina, what we're doing is we are locking people up that we are afraid of and not that we're mad at. One thing that the listeners should know is our population flipped. It used to be 60 percent, roughly, give or take, nonviolent and 40 percent violent. Now it's just the opposite. We have about 60 percent violent and 40 percent nonviolent inside our institutions. What's been public reaction um, in South Carolina to all this? You, you have been in state government for quite a while, and I'm sure you have a sense of public opinion out there. Are most residents aware of some of these changes, recognizing sort of the savings in tax dollars? I will tell you when we announce that we are uh, closing prisons, people like the savings in tax dollars. They like less money going to the government, lower taxes. I can tell you people that are involved in, in law enforcement see this as a positive thing with a historically low recidivism rate, a low crime rate, less prisons being built or no prisons being built and prisons being closed. That's a win-win for the state and the citizens. Well, it is interesting, you know, in your state, your your department isn't the Department or Bureau of Prisons. It's the Department of Corrections. And there's a distinction there, right? There is. You know, prison is meant to be a punishment, but it is also an opportunity for the state to allow people to make the right decision, work hard, get their GED, get their work keys, things of that nature, build up their resume. So there's a great societal cost when a crime is committed. So if we can give people the tools to be successful and they take advantage of it, then that's a win for the taxpayers. That's a win for public safety. That's that's a win for the prison system. It's a win for everybody. We teach carpentry, plumbing, brick masonry, barber shop, auto body, auto painting, HVAC, just a few trades or apprenticeship program. Those are all hopes. Uh, if someone goes out and has a welding certificate, I mean, they can make sixty to $75,000 a year just out the door. Well, there was one young man, they wanted him to get a job, and he couldn't fill out the application, and they thought maybe he was illiterate, needed more education, couldn't read for various reasons, and finally someone figured out that he just couldn't see the paper. So they took him to a free clinic, they got him a free pair of glasses, and he went and applied for a job, and we'll probably never see him again. Hope is key. When you take hope away from, from someone, especially in prison, they're going to lash out and they're going to hurt my officers or they're going to hurt other inmates, sometimes very badly. So building hope and keeping hope is, is very important. Well, that's a hopeful note for us to end on. Thank you, Director Sterling. Earlier, we also heard from Pew's Adam Gelb and State Senator Gerald Malloy. If you'd like to learn more about Pew's Public Safety Performance Project and states' efforts to reform their criminal justice systems, go to pewtrust.org slash after the fact. And please tune in for our next episode when we'll talk with experts from the Pew Research Center about national attitudes on an important public health concern, childhood vaccinations. If you like what you've heard on this podcast, subscribe on iTunes and other streaming services. We'd like to hear from you, too. So write a review and let us know what you think. Thanks for listening. For the Pew Charitable Trusts, I'm Dan LaDuke, and this is After the Fact.